Hi, so this video will be about uh, explaining what happened and uh, what went wrong and why uh, during the troubleshooting of the Asus Rolex Zephyrus uh, GU502 by uh, Norwich Fix. Uh, I'm doing this because in this video we can see a few mistakes which were not explained and I think it can be a trap for beginners. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start playing the video to see what's going on. Here we have an Asus laptop that came in for no power. We already disassembled the board and we're gonna look at the board together and see what's going on. Let's go over to the microscope and start with the DC jack. We have so here we have a no power situation. So we have to take uh, his for, for it because uh, we don't see the symptoms. So let's see what would be the troubleshooting uh, process he's gonna take. The DC connector here. I'm gonna plug a charging cable and we wanna see if 19 volts is going in. Okay, so we, we're gonna see that uh, he's gonna check the 19 volts from the DC in jack, which is a good first step to see if the uh, power is going into the wall and if there is no direct short to run. So let's see. Cable plugged in. And I'm gonna measure at the MOSFET, as you can see on the screen on the source and drain. We should have 19 volts. And I'm reading 19.7. And on drain, I'm reading 19.7. Gate should be somewhere around 24. And we do have 24.9. So these are good measurements. So we can see that the MOSFET shear is being driven properly. So we have 19 volts on the input, 19 volts on the output, no voltage drop across the MOSFET, and gates has around 25 volts, which is normal. It is a N-channel MOSFET, so it is expected to have a gate 6 volts higher than the source, so 6 volts above uh, 19 volts. So everything is good here. If we flip the board, we have a MOSFET on the back also, and we should be reading the same. 19 here, we have 19 here, and the gate, 24.9, so we're all good. So these were the two DC MOSFETs, everything is good here, so main power rail of 19 volt is present. Good. Voltage is going in. Let's keep going. Just quick visual inspection, I want to see if there's anything burnt. So visual inspection is always good when you have a board. Uh, I would say do it first. Even if we, we didn't check any voltage, do a visual inspection. You never know what you are going to find. Liquid damage, burn component, missing component, whatever. Or blown. Or maybe discolored. And we have a lot of MOSFETs here. And here it uh, starts being weird. So why do we check random MOSFETs? We don't know. Okay. What I'm going to do is disconnect power. We're going to manually start measuring components on the board. So, same thing here. Why are we going to measure components randomly? For example, we have MOSFETs here. Quickly go over gate. So, we don't know what the measurements Source, are. Drain. We don't even know what these MOSFETs are and why we are measuring them. Nothing obvious here. So in my opinion there is not... Diode mode reading 0 0.45. There is no reason to go over this. 0 0.6. Uh, shorted MOSFETs can happen, but here there is 0 .48. no reason to do these checks uh, right now. And 0 0.8. Let's continue. So let's keep over this because no uh, there are a few good. MOSFETs being checked and everything is okay. Circuit. So here, same thing for V4. These are dual MOSFETs, but uh, same principle. That's so far, I'm not finding anything wrong with the board. We do not have a short circuit anywhere on the board. All MOSFETs are measuring good. So my take on this is that uh, MOSFETs can fail, yes. But we have the 19 volt uh, power rail present, so there is not much reason to suspect a short run on this rail. 
and shorted. I said, I said MOSFETs are unlikely either. But of course, there, there could be a short on a secondary power rail. And uh, the best way to start checking for this is to have in mind the power seconds of the board and the various power rails on the board. And in my opinion, uh, rather than checking MOSFETs randomly, you should check the inductors. Inductors will always be a source of a power rail, so it's a good uh, checkpoint for this kind of uh, measurement. Measuring randomly just uh, waits time and uh, doesn't give a lot of information. Um, and just a quick note, if you want to check for short to ground, remember that some power rails are uh, low resistance by design, so around the CPU, GPU, and uh, sometimes uh, the chipsets, so source bridge, no merge, and uh, stuff like that, you will measure low resistance. Sometimes, uh, especially newer uh, GPUs, will measure below 1 ohm. So, uh, for now, not much uh, reason to go through this. Uh, you should start by the power seconds and uh, start by finding your 3.0 volt power rails. On this board, there are multiple 3.3 volt power rails. Uh, you will always have an uh, LDU power rail that comes first. So this should be the first step after uh, finding that the um, 19 volt power rail is present. But uh, let's go on. We're gonna plug the cable in and monitor the board under a thermal camera and see if we see anything obvious. So thermal evaluation of the board can be a good uh, diagnostic uh, step. So that's often something I do when I have a board. I don't have a thermal camera, so I just fill the board with uh, my hand. And uh, uh, it's especially common on the desktop boards to be able to pinpoint a problem just with uh, some heat, for example, from the heat nut or the um, audio codec IC. So let's see. Cable plugged in. So the thermal oh, camera oh, makes it right easier. Right off the bat, I see something here. It looks like we're pointing at three capacitors here. But I have a feeling heat is not coming from front of the board. Heat is diffused. And look on the back, yeah. It is coming from back of the board and not from front of the board. So uh, we can see that there is a component that is getting very hot. The board is uh, not turning on, so something getting this hot uh, is most likely a problem. When you identify a component getting really hot, there is no reason to keep it burning itself. Uh, it can only get worse. So once you identify the component, you should unplug the board immediately. So, okay, uh, let's skip to the next step. Okay, and so that's the 12.8.5A. So, 12.8.5A, so this is a Texas Instrument uh, chip. So, this is this component here, TPS 51.285. Okay, and this is a, a dual synchronous step down controller with 5 volt and 3.3 volt LDOs. So, this is a 3 volt, 5 volt regulator. So let's it's see. coming from this chip. Now, if we measure around the chip, just quickly. So checking the zero resistor is useless here, but uh, why not? Meter in diode mode. We do not have a short. So measuring for a short to run is a good idea. That's what you should do. You have a component heating up. The component itself may not be the problem. If it's trying to supply power to a shorted power rail, it can indeed get hot. However, uh, you should not just randomly measure capacitors, uh, because you may not be measuring what you want to measure. You have the datasheet. In fact, you even have the um, schematics for this uh, motherboard. I'm not 100% sure it's the correct board. But uh, anyway, it's the same regulator here, so you have all the information you need. Uh, this regulator produces four different power rates, so you, you need to check for shock tolerance on four different power rates. In fact, the most important ones are these, VREC3, VREC5. These are the LDO outputs. If you take a look at the datasheet uh, in description here, you can see that VREC3, VREC5 are LDO outputs. LDO outputs are supplied internally by the chip, so there is no external component to regulate these power rails, which means that 
When the power rail is shorted, the chip will try to supply power to this power rail, and since it cannot supply enough power, the current going through this chip here will make it heat up. So when you have this free valve fiber regulator heating up, it's always a good idea to suspect VREC3 or VREC5 uh, being shorted to run. The two other power rails created by this chip are the uh, free volt, sorry, free volt is here, a free volt power rail from a buck converter. You can see it's a buck converter because you have high side, low side MOSFET inductors and uh, capacitors. Okay, and you also have a five volt power rail buck converter as well with MOSFET inductor capacitors. Okay, uh, these are unlikely to cause the chip to warm up if they are shorted, but there could be something going on as well, so check it too. Anyway, since you know the main suspects are VREC3, VREC5, you should measure the exact resistance to ground on these pins, pin 3, pin 13. In fact, uh, from this board here, uh, if you check the capacitors, uh, pin 1 is here, pin 2 is here, pin 3 is here, so 3 is connected to this capacitor here, so you are measuring already the um, VREC3 power rail. And same for the VREC5, which is on the other side linked to this uh, capacitor here. Okay. So we are measuring randomly, 0 .4 but voltage drop. Uh, we can so we don't have a short on any one of the caps. All zero ohm resistors are good. The problem is most likely the chip itself. Where are we going to get that chip from? So problem is most likely the chip itself. Yes, this is no problem. However, there is one thing that can happen, and I'm pretty sure this is the case here, is that there is no direct short to run on one of these power rails, but there is a short to run on another power rail derived from this. So you don't see it directly because there are components in between. But the chip will still try to supply the power to the shorted power rail. Anyway, if you don't know that, okay, it makes sense to replace the component. So let's see what's going on. Very good question. I have uh, a lot of donor boards here. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit because uh, he's just uh, looking for a donor board. Okay. Okay, we are not going to watch the replacement. That's where we replace the chip. Right over here. Okay. And I'm going to plug the charging cable. And we're going to monitor this area. Okay, so you can see that immediately the chip gets burning hot. So once you see this information, again, you should unplug the board. No point in letting it burn itself. Uh, you can see that the problem is not resolved. Indeed, uh, the chip could be bad. It could be a donor board with the same problem. But still, this is kind of unlikely, I would say. So you should suspect something else at this point. And we still have heat on this area. Great. Okay. 100. Let's flip the board and the scalps here. Yeah. So just checking another random capacitor, we don't know why. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, no. no. We, we do not have, have an issue here. Checking, uh, checking a random MOSFET. It is probably connected to uh, one of the bug converter rails of the free valve 5 valve regulator, but unlikely to be the problem. 0.87. It's okay. We are reading in the mega ohms, 8 mega ohms, between gate and source. So, at, at this point, he's taking a few measurements. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but according to him, there is an issue with the MOSFETs. I don't see why there would be an issue. Everything seems to be in order, but... Uh, we'll follow them here. So he's removing the MOSFETs. Okay. And he's finding that the measurements are the same. Okay. So he's punching back the MOSFETs. Let's he's gonna take a look at the data sheet. So good idea. Let's check out the data sheet for the 1285A chip. It's a step down controller. And if we go all the way down, usually 
I want to see the pin layout. Okay, right so he's looking for the pin out. Good idea. We see that we have two enable pins. Enable one and... And, uh, no. You don't go for the enable pins at this point. Uh, you already figured out that the chip is trying to supply power. There is something going on with uh, the current consumption. So we don't care if the chip uh, is being enabled or not. In fact, these enables here, in one and in two, are connected to the bug converters, not the LDOs. So these are completely irrelevant for now. Anyway, enable two. VN is pin number 12. VN, we know it's here. There is no question about this because the chip is dissipating power. So it's getting powered. Okay, so I'm interested in seeing if we are getting enable on pin number 20 and pin number 6. So we would be interested in this if the chip wasn't heating up. So if you are missing the power rail and everything otherwise looks to be okay, you check the enable. That will tell you simply the chip is going to uh, create the power rail since it's uh, told to turn on. But here we don't care about this. The chip is supplying power to something in one way or another. So. And okay. also if we have VN, we should have VN because the chip is getting hot. So, so yeah, we should have VN, yes. VN should be there, but we're gonna check. And we're also gonna check for enable one and enable two. If you go down here, it explains what each pin does. I'm gonna plug the charging cable. So there is one issue is the next step he's gonna take. And uh, this is uh, the first uh, major problem we are gonna see in this video. The chip is uh, overheating. It's getting way too hot. So if you keep, keep uh, giving power to the board, it can only get worse. So you already have an issue with a thermal runaway. Chip is heating up. The thing it's supplying to our current to is heating up as well. So it will try to supply more current and heating up even more. So it can only get worse. And at worst, you are going to get the chip uh, just to burn itself. And this is what we are going to see later on. The second problem is that here, we will be taking measurements uh, with the uh, power plug-in since we are going to check voltages. We don't need to check voltages uh, right now. If you don't need power to the board, take all of the measurements you can without power. Use res resistance measurements, twice the power rails. Everything you can do without power is always better than with power. There are many mistakes you can do with power plugged-in. So, yeah reasons not to do these checks uh, right now anyway let's go ahead the problem is the temperature is reaching about 300 fahrenheit on that chip i'm not sure what it is in the Celsius, but it sounds uh, really high so you should be unplugging the board right now so we cannot keep it for long and now i'm gonna go to voltage mode and start measuring enable 2 is on the bottom right here and uh, right now I'm reading 0 0.2. So in table voltage is almost zero. It should be about three volts. Uh, if you have a problem on the LDOs, you are not gonna get enable signals for the bug converters since you are stuck before that in the power seconds. If we measure enable one on top, are we gonna get the same 0 0.2? Okay, and uh, another mistake right here, which uh, is debatable. But here you can see that he's probing on the pin of the chip. Issue here is that the probe is candle large and we are not in the correct orientation. So you could be bridging these two pins right here. And this could cause the chip uh, cause damage to the chip or to external components. So in my opinion, here the tracks are very clearly laid out. Uh, you should not be checking directly on the pins. You even have uh, schematics and whatever you need. So just check on the components connected next to the chip if you can. There is one situation you want to check on the chip is that if the board doesn't have traces clearly laid out 
or if there is liquid damage, because if you have liquid damage, you could have a break in the trace somewhere. And again, if you suspect a break in the trace, you can also check without power, without voltage measurement, but just resistance measurements. And yes, okay. 0 0.21. And if we measure Vn, which should... And yeah, this is especially an issue with Vn, which, uh, which uh, goes up here. Uh, since it's 19 volts, you are going to check 19 volts just right next to another pin here. I don't think this is a mistake that has been made here, but it is very likely that you touch both of these pins or any other, but especially this one and this one, which has 19 volt from here, and you burn the chip, you burn something else like the capacitor, or whatever uh, is on the other line. So if you're we right here, close it, the probe gets right next between these two pins, but I don't think it touch. So let's see. It should be right here or this pin here. Yeah, the probe we didn't should. touch, but at this point, the chip burnt anyway. So this is maybe just uh, a bit uh, unlucky. So not too much of a problem. Uh, just that considerably while here, but there may still be some metal over here that will have to be dug out. If we have enable. And uh, no. We don't want to test if we have enabled here. If you are checking this, we are going to make a huge mistake. So first thing, uh, the pads aren't clean. On EN1 and EN2. Okay, so I'm going to plug the power. And uh, secondly, no, never plug the power in when you have removed a chip, especially a chip like this. So just to clarify, uh, there is most likely a, bri a bridge here. Can't see really well, but uh, you shouldn't plug power when you have a bridge on pins, obviously. But you shouldn't plug power either if you are missing a bug controller or MOSFET driver in general. What happens is that if you remove the chip here, you have VH2, so the second channel for the 3 volts bug power, right? Uh, driving the high side MOSFET here, this pin here, and if you look at this pin here, it goes to this uh, zero resistor and then to this MOSFET. There is nothing else on this line. So if you remove the chip, you remove all the connection of the gate to something else. What happens is that now the gate is floating. If you are lucky, the gate's charge will stay at zero, and the MOSFET will never turn on. If you are unlucky, and it is very likely to happen, the gate will pick up some charge at one point. And if it picks up uh, some charge, it may start turning on the MOSFET. And if you start turning on this MOSFET uh, in an uncontrolled manner, well, you are just going to send the voltage from here, AC bat sys, which is 19 volt, to the free volt power rail. And this is obviously uh, damage, maybe the MOSFET, maybe this one, maybe capacitors, but worse is that we, you will damage whatever else is on this power rail, like the PCH. So never do this. If you are lucky enough, if you make this mistake, both MOSFETs will turn on at the same time, and you will just short your main power rail to gone which is not a big deal, you could kill both, both MOSFETs, maybe the protection circuit in the main power rail. But the issue really is when this MOSFET turns on, this one hasn't turned really on yet, you will send 19 volts to your 3 volt power rail. So never turn on a computer, never plug power uh, or whatever to a board if it's missing a component and you don't know if it's safe to turn on or not. If you don't know, just don't do it. If you want to turn on this board now, you will have to put back the component. The other way, if you really need to troubleshoot without this component, you will have to remove this MOSFET, this MOSFET, or maybe not this one, but at the very least, the high side MOSFETs here and here. Okay. And of course, no bridges. Clean up the pads. 
let's measure here we should have 19 volts okay so now i'm not even reading and now we lost 19 volts so what could have happened let's see 19 volts we're gonna have to check the mosfets and see if those mosfets are still good but here nothing Zero point two on gate, so we have no voltage on the power MOSFET. Let's check the first power MOSFET, which is this one here, right next to the connector, and see if we have anything here. We should have twenty-four volts, and now we are getting zero point three volts. No nineteen here, and we have nineteen here. So we have nineteen volts here, but it's not going in because we now probably have a short on the MOSFET on back of the board, right next to the current sense resistor, we most likely have a short here now, which is very common on Asus laptops. I've done a lot of videos on this very same problem, but today's problem is unique. Yeah, this is the ju not just uh, Asus laptop, it's uh, very common on laptops in general. Uh, issue of the main power rails, maybe one of the most common problem we will see. By the way, this is not really relevant uh, right now, but you if you have an issue with your main power array, your um, your charging circuit or whatever, just go to badcaps.net, to the forum, go to the laptops section, and you will see a laptop battery charging circuit thread with some theory on how it works and a pretty long. Uh, troubleshooting section to tell you all you have to do to um, fix your problem okay because that chip just blew out in our face you want to fix me take this and that's what happened you see we have a short now so we have a short to ground on the main power rail we have a short right here now so my guess is that when he played power with the um, back controller removes it indeed damage the MOSFETs uh, what blew up previously was, was uh, this chip this chip blew up and we removed it from the board so unlikely that the main power rail uh, will stay shorty at this point maybe something else blew up at the same time but my guess is that after plugging power with the chip removed, this shorted. And what is causing the short? Let's inject voltage. Uh, another mistake. Don't just inject voltage randomly. I mean, I'm doing all this and I'm not going to be able to fix this laptop today because we don't have the chip, but I'm just curious to know what has shorted. We have a short circuit on the board now. Before injecting voltage, you should evaluate exactly what is the resistance to ground on your main power rail. This will give you information on what could be shorted. If you had a high side MOSFET shorted, maybe you will read a resistance to ground that's similar to what you will have on one of the secondary power rails. So, for example, similar resistance to what you have on Vico or whatever. Not just inject for them. If you don't know how to interpret the resistance readings, ask someone who does. I did not want to leave you hanging, so I just wanted to go further. I wanted to see if we had enable signal, but we do not even have a 19 volt signal. And that happened after the chip burned. It just suddenly decided to burn. Okay, so let's inject voltage. Right there, right there. Okay, so this is... And additionally, it wasn't clear here, but when you want to inject voltage on a power rail, especially with the main power rail, never inject 19 volts. Always inject around 1 volt, let's say, so that if you have a shorted SI MOSFET and it goes to the CPU, the CPU doesn't get damaged with 1 volt. If you send it 19 volt, it's instant death. So just start with one volt and check where is the power going. This is what got hot. This, right there. 
So now we have a one ohm capacitor apparently which is uh, getting hot. Um, it will be kinda difficult, but maybe we can try to identify it from the complete garbage uh, board view I have here. So let's see if it wants to load. So we are next to the PCH. Is it possible that we have a problem with our PCH, which is right here? It's very possible. Let me measure in diode mode. So we have a short here. We have, and we have a short. So this is the positive side of the capacitor since it's uh, SMD uh, aluminum polymer in a square package. Okay. And if we look on the board view, here is the PCH, and I think we are around here. So this is PCE8704. So let me open the schematic. PCE8704. And what do you know? PCE8704 is on this 3 volt power rail. It didn't just short randomly because it wanted to. Uh, clearly, something went wrong at this stage and power got sent to this. Note that the capacitor itself is not on the main power rail. There should be this MOSFET in between. So if you have a short both on the main power rail and on this rail here, which was unshorted at the beginning, then uh, it's almost certain that this MOSFET shorted. And it shorted because it didn't have a gate drive to pull it low. So it's spuriously uh, turned on and uh, burnt. And so now we check and we see that there is still a short ground on this rail. So obviously, as I said, it's not just this capacitor that failed. When you send 90 volt to this, you kill other stuff. You kill especially the PCH right next door. I think I'm gonna create a section for schematics on our forum. So if you do have a schematics and board view diagram for this laptop, you can leave it there. Let me uh, also, I found the schematics and board view uh, in a few seconds using uh, uh, my preferred uh, search engine. And uh, of course, it was on the forum I showed earlier. So not very difficult to find. Of course, not all schematics are available, but uh, this one was. So okay. you know what you think. And I'll see you again in the next video. So what I think is that there were several mistakes uh, made in this video. Uh, first mistake is not having a proper troubleshooting process. When you have a no power board like this, the visual inspection was good. Uh, checking if 19 volts, which is the main power rail, was good. But then, if you already plugged power into the board, you might as well check your uh, user voltages. So you will gonna check. We, you here will have to check at least on the uh, inductors of the board to see what voltages you get. And on, uh, if you have the schematics, on most schematics. You will find a list of power rails, so you already have this uh, black diagram with a list of power rails. But uh, okay, this one is a bit messy. But you will often have also a power table and maybe even a power sequence. So let's see the schematics. There are a lot of stuff. As I said, it's quite a bit messy, but uh, we'll have to deal with it. Okay. This is irrelevant. So we went past through uh, several power rates already. So here is a nice pages. So it's a called a power flow chart. So the power flow chart tells you where does the power come from. So it comes from here, the DC inject, DC inject. Uh, going through the DC MOSFETs, uh, controlled by the charger IC, and then goes through AC batteries, which is your main power rail. AC batteries from this power rail will, will have 
all the other power rails of the machine. So the one uh, we just looked at uh, were the 5 volt and 3 volt power rail created here. So with this kind of diagram, you see all the power rails of the machine. So it should be quite easy to see what did you have on the board when it wasn't working. So for example, if you look at this, you can see that all these power rails are derived from the 3 volt, 5 volt regulator. So you should be able to quickly see that you need to check, for example, the 5 volt LDO and the 3 volt LDO. And if you are lucky, here we are very lucky. On this schematic, you have a power second diagram. So this power second diagram tells you what's the first power rail to show up, what are the next power rates in sequence up until you get to the machine being fully turned on at this point. So first thing you check is 3 volt uh, RTC. So this one is derived from the LDO. We'll show that later. And you have the 3 volt and 5 volt from the LDO. This comes first. Then if we uh, scroll down a little bit, you can see right here, this is the 3 volt um, buck converter output, which comes later in the sequence after a few other things have happened. So no point in checking the buck converter, the enable signals, if you don't get this. And in this case, even if we didn't get the measurements, I'm 99% certain that we didn't get the 3 volt LDO. Okay, so why do I suspect something going on with this 3 volt LDO? As I said, when the 3 volt 5 volt regulator heats up, most likely you got a problem with this LDO outputs. So let me go back to the schematics. Varic 3, Varic 5. Okay. If you have a problem with this, but we didn't get the exact measurements, but apparently there was no direct short to run on this. What could go wrong? Well, let's see. On this diagram, you can see that, uh, of course, it doesn't show up. <laughs> My bad. But anyway, uh, this power rail, 3 volt alloys on here from the LDO will almost always feed another power rail which is very important which is the RTC power rail. This is the first rail required by, by the PCH. The RTC power rail is used by the RTC clock uh, to keep the time and if we uh, take a look at this so we had the 3 volt AO. If you take a look at 3 volt AO uh, here, 3 volt AO is uh, connected directly to 3 volt A. If you scroll down the schematic, it's uh, quite messy. Uh, at one point, you will find that this 3 volt A goes through the zero on the resistor, then through a dual diode to 3 volt LCC. So, what's going on here? Is that if you don't have power here, then 3 volt RTC is fed by the coin cell battery. The coin cell battery, the 3 volt battery, the so small uh, CR2032 for example, uh, feeds power through this resistor, through this part of the dual diode to the 3 volt RTC. If you have power here, which is at 3.3 volt, which should be higher than the 3 volt battery here, it will feed power to the 3 volt RTC power rail. What happens is that if you have a shorter ground on this 3 volt RTC power rail, first, when the board is unplugged from uh, all power, it will empty the RTC battery. So you can measure that we have 0 volt, 0 volt on this battery. But also, it will draw power from this power rail. So when you plug your uh, this in jack. The 3 volt 5 volt regulator we saw here will feed power through this pin, through this zero of this or, through this diode here, to this power rail, which is most likely shorted. And sadly, in most cases, if you have a short on this power rail, it means that your PCH is dead. Let's see why. 
you can see that you have a couple of capacitors here. Let's say that they fail in 1% of the time. It happens, but it's very, very rare. Most of the times, your 3 volt RTC power line uh, goes through here, uh, the room resistor. In most cases, uh, there is no resistor, but here there is one, so whatever. To this VCC PRTC 3P3, and this power wire, as you can see, goes to our PCH. This is our uh, common point uh, PCH here. Yeah. You can see we are on the PCH page. So this goes to the RTC well of the PCH. And in most cases, it means the PCH is dead. This RTC power array should measure hundreds of kilo ohms, maybe even in the mega ohms. If you measure the current flowing through the RTC battery to the RTC power array, you should measure something like 10 microns, a very, very small current draw, because it's supposed to run for years. So in this case, I'm pretty sure when we started this video. So on this board, I'm pretty sure uh, the issue was that this PCH was dead. RTC power rail shorted to ground through this PCH. So of course, it's not easy to see. I won't expect a beginner to see this problem. A beginner will most likely see that there is something going wrong in this circuit, but will not be able to trace it through the RTC power rail. However, an experienced technician at uh, board repair should be able to trace this. And in fact, it's becoming so common to have this kind of issue that you have to expect this kind of problem. It's quite unfortunate that uh, hundreds of thousands of people are going to see this video and not understand what's going on at all. So, yeah. And as for the mistakes that were made, I already talked about them, but in the same forum, in bad caps, if you still go to the laptops section, you can see another thread called Beginner's Guidelines. So this is useful because it helps you identify the hardware you are working with. There are a few checks, but it's quite succinct here for what can go wrong if you have an issue with the board. But more importantly, the second part of this guide tells you this, what not to do. First, never will flow large BJ. Okay, uh, this is not the problem here. Maybe we'll talk about it another time. Don't suspect that something is shorted with no reason. Okay, that wasn't the case here, but it can happen. Be aware that CPUV core or GPUV core will measure very, very low uh, resistance to ground. Voltage indirection is used to find the shorter ground. If you can't find it visually, there is no point in injective voltage. Only consider it after you find uh, there is shorter ground and after doing a visual inspection. Never inject 19 volts. Uh, I would always uh, see people injecting 19 volts on the main power rail when it is like a 6 ohms, which is clearly a shorted dice MOSFET to CPU V core and you send 19 volts to the CPU. Start at 1 volt and check if any ABJ is warming up or getting powered. It shouldn't have power when you inject 1 volt on the main power array. Never randomly replace components. Uh, this can lead to other mistakes. In this situation, uh, a component was replaced. It's to be expected. If you want to troubleshoot a board, sometimes you have to make compromise. You can't trace everything. So sometimes Replacing a component, even if you are not 100% sure it's a problem, can still be a reasonable idea. So it's not a main mistake, I think, here. But still consider that in this case, we would have been able to troubleshoot the board without injecting any voltage, without uh, taking any measurements while the board was powered on, and without replacing any component. And, uh, Never bridge uh, MOSFET use components. Thankfully, it didn't happen here, but on some other videos on YouTube, you can see this very often, so don't do it. But main major mistake was this one. Don't apply power to the board with missing components. If you don't know if it's safe, don't do it. 
In this case, it wasn't safe. It will destroy the board. Powering a board without the bug controller or the MOSFET driver. MOSFET gates will be floating. They will charge enough so that the MOSFET turns down. And uh, if it turns on, of course, it's gonna send 19 volt to whatever the power hub was. So don't do it. So I think uh, that's it for this uh, video. It was uh, kind of a rant, but I see very, very, very often these kind of mistakes on the various uh, online chats and forums and uh, whatever. So please, please, first read this thread if you are that one of the patient sure what it is about and. If you don't know, ask questions. Stop, don't do anything that could damage the bond. Ask the question and provide every information you can. So first, everything about the hardware, but also uh, some things, for example, uh, that can really help getting an answer faster is attaching a picture of the board with resistance to run motion machines and if relevant, voltage measurements on the ingot towers. Okay, at least I hope uh, this will help uh, some people. This will be a quite a long video, but uh, thanks for watching.